everyone. Uh, my name is Lin, and I'm from Deloitte Platform Engineering, and I will be the MC for the second session of Execution Stream, which deals with technical aspects of building, managing, and securing APIs. So um, let's welcome our first speaker, Alex Kilko, who is the CTO of PlayQ. Alex has over 15 years of global experience delivering a number of highly scalable interactive online products to customers. He's here to talk to us about the path from micro to macro coordination through domain-centric DDL pipeline. And um, there is five minute Q&A at the end of each talk. So if, you're, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat during the talk or hold them until the end. Over to you, Alex. Hello. All right, okay, just put the sharing. And we should be good to go now. All right, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, today who is in Australia and everyone who is outside. Uh, thank you again for the introduction. So uh, my name is Alex, as was mentioned, I'm working as a CTO at PlayQ, uh, which is a California, HQ California based company. Um, and uh, I wanted to present basically the path we've taken uh, from micro coordination to macro coordination when it comes to development of services and uh, basically technological products for the company. So a bit of a context of what uh, who PlayQ is and what we are doing. Uh, so the domain we're working in is mobile games. So you can see uh, a few screenshots on the right-hand side, which are uh, made out of our games. Uh, we have a distributed team, we have people in California, Ireland, Ukraine, and Australia. And the tech that we're working on, besides the games themselves, um, is a platform which has the client-facing component, and it also has a back-office component. So you can think of everything that you that you would be willing to do with the games in terms of analytics, some uh, cloud functionality, some authentication stuff, uh, that all comes down uh, to the client facing um, side of things. And then we, all, we have also the back office facing, which is uh, everything that the company needs uh, to function and do um, and take business decisions based upon the data that we receive. Um, like in, on one of the screenshots, you can see actually the leaderboard rankings uh, that is actually powered by one of the services in our uh, platform. So the platform itself has a quite diverse set of areas that it covers. Uh, so we have authentication, analytics. Um, we deal with uh, user storage. Uh, we have uh, real-time stuff, such as leaderboard matches. Uh, we process payments um, while mostly doing validations and uh, storing the data for payments and kind of keeping track of the inventory for people. Um, we have the back office integration with ad networks, attribution providers. Uh, we do push notifications, we orchestrate all of the platform, um, and so on and so on. So there's quite a lot of areas. Um, this is probably like maybe listed 20 to 30 percent of what we actually have. Um, we've been in production with this tech for the past four years. And um, the languages that we have, or I would say use uh, predominantly, are C Sharp, uh, because we build our games in Unity. So we have the C Sharp component. We use TypeScript for a web portal, uh, which helps us orchestrate the platform. Basically, it's a window into the platform itself from the management perspective when it comes down to creating new applications in a platform or to, let's say, do some user support requests. And on the back end, we have uh, Go and Scala. So Go um, is now a small portion of it. So we predominantly focus on Scala-based services. And the Services this, themselves, we have about, I wanted to talk about services specifically, not about uh, SDK or uh, C Sharp. Um, the services themselves, we have about 20 of those. They're quite high performance, high performant. Um, the, I would say the, the range of response time for our services is within 10 to maybe 70 or maybe sometimes up to 100 milliseconds, depending on the payload. Um, the 10 millisecond response is usually for services that do not require any payload to be returned to the user. So you could think of something like submit an al analytical events um, and might be a bit bigger when it comes down to services which serve some user data. So when it comes down to, let's say, uh, pulling down the user profile or their progress in the game or something like that, which might have quite a lot of data accumulated, uh, then it would be slightly higher. But generally, we focus on performance uh, because that's kind of the 
quintessential things in most of the gaming applications. Um, and the interesting thing of, in all of this is that the services team themselves um, is not that big. It's only six persons. Um, out, of the, out of those, I'm one of them, and I share responsibilities with other teams as well. So um, that is probably like five and, and a fraction in reality. So how did we achieve that and what, we, what we've done uh, to have it running smoothly uh, on a large scale with quite a lot of services with such a relatively small team? I wanted to step back a little bit and talk about services uh, development and API development in general, just so we could have a good breakdown of what we actually do when we try to create a service. So the, the typical breakdown would look like this. Um, I'll start from the bottom, explaining what those blocks are, and uh, then we could um, kind of discuss a little bit more uh, the problems that come with those. So at the very bottom, we pretty much have transport usually. It's um, either HTTP requests, could be sockets, could be uh, direct TCP connections um, or something else. It's pr pretty much just a way to deliver data from point A to point B. Then we have routing uh, with an, on, on top of the transport. So you could think of different paths, versions, um, some URLs or whatever, whatever is relevant to the underlying transport. Then the data that you deliver from one side to the other one is basically models and codecs. So if you have JSON, so you have a JSON representation on the wire of some models um, in your new APIs, and then could be a couple of different codecs, could be XML, could be JSON, could be something else. And then on top of that, once you have the payload delivered, you need to dispatch some, um, let's say, logic handling. So you could think of it as on a server side, that would be something where once everything has arrived, uh, once everything is decoded, recreated, and you're ready to process that request, that's where you dispatch the actual handler for the, for the logic. So in terms of uh, let's say HTTP request, you could you could have those typical handlers and say like, well, on this path with the get request, you will do this, and that that the the body of that handler is basically what dispatcher is calling in, and then you have the domain design and business logic on top. So domain design is pretty much the high level business entities that you're going to be working with. It's um, it's irrelevant to what goes below it, dispatchers, models, and everything else. Domain design is mostly focusing on the types of entities and their relation. So you can think of it as, uh, let's say, if you're working in real estate, the type of entities you would have would be something like uh, a buyer, a seller, an agent, a property, and so on. And they will all have their own fields. They will have their own relations. They will have their own hierarchy, and so on. And then the business logic on top of that pretty much defines what exactly your application is doing. So you would say, well, if A, then do B. And if he is a part of C, then do something else. So that's kind of the break. Usually, uh, if you think about this and kind of how, how the actual development flows uh, during the API and services development, you would come up with a bunch of problems. I'm going to. Uh, shed light on what we experienced. Uh, everyone has probably their own challenges, but uh, the most common ones we've seen were information is usually fragmented and decentralized. Um, so the reason for that is that if you're building a platform which covers a lot of areas, you might you might have requests coming in from different stakeholders. So we usually have people coming from the data science team um, and asking for something, then someone from the game engineers would come in and ask for something. Uh, then the product guys would come in and say, hey, we, we want to have that feature. And most most times, they would uh, present that in a way they're used to do it in their teams, uh, what they want, um, some kind of fragmented specs. They might send some spreadsheets, emails, or whatever. Um, sometimes those would be just ad hoc requests. So someone would type in Slack and say, hey, can we add that field over there? Uh, we want to keep track of that as well. And then um, oftentimes, those are also incomplete. Um, so if you think about the design phase, uh, you can't really wait until everything is very uh, well designed just because it's going to take a lot of time to make sure that every single detail is uh, taken into account. And most of the time, there might be some, especially if you're building something new that doesn't exist on the market yet, you might have even unclear areas that, that you have to do R&D before you actually know how it's going to look like in the end. So oftentimes, it would come in and say, like, well, let's say for the user model, we'll have just a name and a last name. and Anything else, we'll just figure out later and edit later. So that's kind of the idea of the in, uh, incomplete data that comes. The, the other problem is that there are no really good solutions which would map business domain to code itself. Um, 
usually entities which exist in business domain, they're very complex. Uh, they have hierarchy, they have relations, um, and composition of those is not very easy. So think of something uh, as, as an example with the real estate. You will have some entities which represent a physical person, some entities which represent a legal entity. All of them could share, for example, an address. All of them could have, um, let's say, could belong to a legal entity if it's an agent. If a seller and buyer might not be relevant to any legal entities, and so on. So you have a lot of relations which which you somehow need to present in code, and there is no really something that would be very convenient to do that. Uh, most of the, the the design tooling that we have uh, is usually contained within some isolated and quite atomic models that we could present, and then when it comes down to try to um, look holistically at it, uh, it becomes very tedious. The the other thing is most of the work is generally very mechanical. So if you think of, if you think about this uh, breakdown on the right hand side, uh, everything that is green is pretty much mechanical. So once you know the entities you're going to be working with, um, everything else is just going into mode of writing code and spending a lot of time just recreating everything you have on the design or in specs. So it's very time consuming. Um, it involves a lot of other teams, um, especially if you work in multiple languages, because you need to make sure that whatever you send over the over the wire is going to be consistent across multiple languages. And you also have team interlocking. So sometimes, um, unless one team is done with their, let's say, design for the service, uh, the other team cannot really start working. And the last one is evolution and refactoring, which is very error prone. Um, so. You could think of it as any time you need to add a field uh, anywhere in the blue boxes, it has to be propagated all the way down. So you have to actually go and modify everywhere. You need to make sure that you you don't forget about it. Uh, and then you have to go to other teams and discuss with them as well. And if you have an error somewhere in the upper layers, you also have to propagate all of those fixes um, to the bottom. And the probably the most sad thing is that the more languages you have, the the bigger the problem gets. It multiplied, it is multiplied with every single new consumer uh, that you would get for your services. So you can think of it as you know, you need to have those different teams. They need to coordinate on how exactly they're going to shape the APIs, shape the models, and then they have to coordinate all of the development. And the meat of most applications is just the blue boxes. The rest is quite mechanical. So. The solution that we came up with, uh, call it IDL, it's IDL Lingua, which is the intermediate definition language. Um, the the main points that we have uh, that made it possible for us to uh, get rid of a lot of problems is have a single source of truth for everything, um, use a reach type system uh, which uh, has full reliance on code generation, and we have a CI/CD based changes propagation. Um, I'll I'll discuss. Uh, each of those points in a bit more detail shortly. So the single source of truth that we have is basically just a single Git repo, uh, which has definitions for all of the services. So you get, this is an actual repo from um, GitHub that we have. This, these are names of our services. There is a, a bunch of them more down there. But basically, whoever needs to know anything about the APIs, they go to this repo and they take a look at the definitions there. They don't really go to the code. Uh, that of their target platform, they actually go to the definitions because they, mo in most cases, they will have all of the details that they need to know about what they're working with, and then later on they could actually fall back to the code and work with it. The reach type system that I mentioned, um, it's designed to reflect the complex relation between the models, so that adds a couple of different types, uh, which are quite unique to it. So you can think uh, of it like the enumeration is relatively standard. There's a couple of types, such as ID, which is uh, a specific type. If you work with some of the APIs, or let's say that of Stripe, the payment service, they have a prefix on most of the identifiers that they have. So like they would have a card, a customer, um, account, and everything else. Because if you have a GUID on a wire and someone accidentally swapped, uh, let's say, an ID of a user with ID of uh, a wallet, and both of those are GUIDs. You will never, you will never know easily what exactly is going on until you actually debug all the way through and try to figure out what's going on. That's why most of the providers they start uh, 
add in prefixes so that it's clear what exactly is going on and what that data is and what it's meant to be. So the this is the type ID, which might be composite. It might have a GUID, for example, or it might have an integer. It might have two fields. It might be something like a company ID plus the user ID within the company. So it could be composite. The mix in is, if you're familiar with CSS preprocessors, uh, it's just an interface. So you could mix it in into other entities. You could inherit from it. So the example here is uh, we have two mix-ins. One is entity, one is person, and one class, which is user. And that user inherits nominally entity. So it's actually going to be the, uh, the nominal inheritance there. And if you see the plus person, it just means that it's going to be structural inheritance. It's going to take all of the fills from the person mix-in and place them into the user uh, class. And we add one more, which is password, which is specific to, to a user. And then you have, let's say, the need to define a public user. You could probably just recreate all of the fields manually, but it's way easier to do it this way. So you just say, OK, I'm going to structurally take everything from user, and I'm going to remove the password because I don't want people to see it. And if you make any changes to, let's say, entity mix in, it's going to be automatically reflected on all of the entities everywhere. And then there is a few uh, other types which are available. And the interesting one is algebraic data type, which is ADT over there. Um, it represents something that does not necessarily have a common parent, but it could be either either of the, either of the elements. So the, the example here is just success and failure, but you might have an ADT which represents a bunch of things, not only success and failure, but could be different types of entities which have no relation to each other, but they are still legit variations. I'll show an example of that as well. So in this example, result could be an ADT, which is a class of success type or the class of failure type. It's quite intuitive, and it's easy to read. Uh, so if you look on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, these are pretty much the same definitions. Uh, the one on the right-hand side is quite verbose in how you have to write it down. The one on the left is very similar to what engineers are used to. So you have an enumeration there, hunt and scale. Um, you also have a field, which is hunt and scale. Uh, you have the relation that a cat is a nominal, uh, nominally inherits a pet mix in, and then you can add something in pet, and so also I didn't extend it here, for, for example. But uh, generally, you should be able to grasp the, the gist of it. Uh, the next thing we do is we have full reliance on code generation. Uh, we don't write anything manually. We generate everything, every single thing that we design. And uh, in this example, like from those definitions, we'll get code generated in all of the target languages. And all of that gets. Uh, process through a C CI CD pipeline. So any change you do to definitions it goes on the build machine. That get, gets all of the languages built. Then it gets uh, those pushed to corresponding repositories. And then from those repositories, the consumers could take it. So that's, in a nutshell, how it works. Um, I'm going to give an example of an API um, definition for authentication for an authentication service. Um, it's going to, I'm not going to dive into the implementation aspects of it, but I'm going to uh, mostly focus on the, the design of it and how it would look like if you try to do it quickly. So let's say someone comes in and says, we're going to have an authentication service which needs to support email and Google. And uh, the email login and Google login, that's all you have. So you will start with something that would look like this. So you'll say, OK, uh, we're going to have login with email, uh, which is going to have an email and a password hash. Then we're going to have login with Google. And Google usually provides an access token, so we're just going to have one filled access token. So either of those, email or Google, uh, could be used as a login request. So that's why we place them together in ADT, which is algebraic data type, and say, OK, login request could be either login with email or login with Google. So this is the input to the login. And then we have the output, which just say, OK, let's say login response is going to be just a username once you're logged in. And in case it failed, uh, we'll return some generic failure, which could be uh, just a code and a message, the code you could use for localization and a message you could dis display as it. And all of that is going to get wrapped in the authentication service with a single method defined as login, which takes data, which is a login request, and returns a login response or generic failure. Then you start that initial design, and someone says, well, look, we want to have a company ID so that we could have a multi-tenant deployment. So you could think of it as uh, Teams in Slack, where you log it into a particular team with your credentials. They'll say, OK, uh, let's do those changes in the definitions. I grayed out everything that remains the same and just highlighted the, the things that we're going to add. So we create a new mix-in login with, which has a company ID, and that's the only field there. 
and we inherit login with email and login with Google from that login with uh, company. If we will have some extra changes, uh, extra fields added to login with, it's also going to automatically get added to those login with email and login with Google. And that's pretty much the only changes you need to do. So what happens after this, if you put it in a pipeline and actually build it and distribute it across multiple languages, the outcome of it, um, and I'm going to show the TypeScript, TypeScript example. It's a bit simpler to read. Um, so this is an example of login with and login with email uh, generated. So you can see an example on the, on the left-hand side of how the definition looks like and what exactly VS Code, I use VS Code in this example, is going to show you if you try to use those. So you don't really do anything except you import those login with email model from a package that gets generated. And then you have all of the hints. Uh, you have all of the fields. Everything is already prepared for you. Uh, there is a bunch of helper methods, uh, which you could see, such as to login with, uh, load login with. Those are converters, which allow you to convert from one structure to another one. So if you have a relation between different structures, you could easily get a slice of one structure and put it into another structure, and you can recreate it easily uh, without the need to manually copy all of the fields, which also removes a lot of errors uh, where it comes down to, let's say, you manually copy all of the fields from one place to another one, and then you forget to do it. Um, because someone added a new field and it didn't break, and then eventually you have that field never filled in. And that's the TypeScript client generated. So you have for the service that we had, uh, which has a single method login. Uh, you can see an example at the bottom. So I instantiate an instance of that client for the authentication service, and it has all of the definitions also uh, created for it, the implementation as well. Uh, so you only need to, and what it says, to me is here, I forgot the data argument, which has to be a login request type. The interesting thing is that it generates not only clients, but it also generates the server side for all of the languages. So this is an example of how the definition looks like for the client and the service server. So you see the client is just one method login uh, with the data and returns a promise. Um, for the service, it is a slightly different because it has the first parameter as a context, and this is what you can provide um, something custom to your particular service. So think of it as, let's say you want to authenticate the user from the headers, and then you want to pull from the database the details about the user. And then by the time you get to the actual handler of the method, you want to have already the details, whether the user is authenticated, whether the, uh, I don't know, he's a part of the company or something else. So that's where you could use the context. You could have uh, pre-request hooks, uh, do some pre-processing hooks, and then fill in the context so that you could um, easily extract the information that you need on a, on a large scale for all of the handlers that you have for the server. It has a base um, has a base implementations, which has uh, kind of all of the methods implemented, but you also throw an exception. So you have to override those and basically implement. But it's very easy to get started. And then later on, let's say you're working on it, you have that code generated, you started writing, and someone says, look, we want to have two-factor authentication during login. Uh, like, could you help us with that? It's like, OK, uh, we're going to do a few more changes. And again, the same way uh, grayed out is everything that is the same. i will say, look, um, the login request, uh, the login respawn, response might now ask a user for an MFA code. So we say, OK, instead of login success, we now have two options. It's either going to be success or we're going to need extra bit of information from the user. So you can see I wrapped up login response into a, another algebraic data type, login result, and it has two, two branches of it, login response or MFA request. An MFA request is just a message to the user, something like, uh, we've, sent an, we've sent an SMS code to your phone uh, and the number of the phone, and then some token to keep track of that. And we will say, OK, um, so that's going to be the response. That's how we're going to find out that we need an MFA code. And then how do we actually do the login? Well, there was two ways to do it. One, you could actually add another method, and say, like, confirm MFA or something. Or you could just extend the ADT that we have already for the login request and say, we're going to have an extra call to login, but now with login with 2FA, where we're going to provide the code and the original token that was requested. And that's all you have to do. Um, once you've filled on those models, uh, once you're done with those models, they're going to get translated, transpiled into the corresponding languages. And you, the only thing you're going to do is in the handler of the response, you would say, you would say, okay, if login response is instance of MFA request, then change the UI and ask the user to basically show some code request. Otherwise, just continuous execution. And that's pretty much the the bulk of it of what it would what it would entail if you want to build an API uh, for authentication with just a single login method. So I want to 
<clears throat> I wanted to provide some summary on uh, what we've achieved ourselves with getting this pipeline running. We have about 60 to 70% of the code generated. I actually looked up the numbers yesterday. Uh, we have about 250, so a quarter of a million lines of code generated in TypeScript code base and about 95,000 lines of code of the actual business logic. Then in Scala code base, we have about 187,000 generated and 120,000 uh, actual code for the business logic. We focus only on the business logic and design. We don't we don't manually write anything, uh, which would entail like those models or transport or anything. Only business logic, and every stakeholder as well works in an asynchronous way, which is very important. So we have the, we have that repo which I mentioned previously, which is a single source of uh, truth for us. So whoever needs to make any changes, they go to that repo, they propose the changes, either create a pull request or something, and they pretty much could kind of do it on their own. And then later on, if it gets merged somewhere, it's going to get built with a new version. Whoever is going to pull that version in their code base, they're going to see immediately the changes. So there is no coordination on username, capital, camel case, snake case, whatever. Um, when it comes to actual implementation, we don't discuss those things. They just happen magically um, or automatically. Uh, any API design change is immediately visible to everyone on the teams. Uh, so you do the change, everyone could see it right away if they update the APIs from repos. Refactoring is orders of magnitude easier because uh, all of the types are preserved and you can immediately see the problems if something comes up. All of the code is automatically regenerated, so it makes, makes it way easier. New APIs and changes, we do through pull requests. So we create a branch, uh, we design a new service or changes to an existing service there. Uh, and then after that, we pretty much just submit a pull request, people review it, comment on it, modify something if they need to, and then that gets merged into develop and we start working on the actual implementation. The interesting thing with this is that I mentioned previously that for all languages, we generate the server and client code, and that makes it possible to uh, start working on the mocks of the server even without the service side ready. You could pretty much write the whole, let's say, front end without the services because you already have all of the definitions. So you could mock and create whatever responses you need uh, to test with your UI. And then once the back end is ready, you could just switch the endpoint where you connect and you're done. And that basically takes us to the point number eight, which is integration is quite a bliss. Uh, it's quite error prone. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't discuss errors that happen at that level. There is just no room for it. Uh, there are no typos, no missing data. It's pretty much always consistent, whatever you do. And uh, yeah, if you if you look on the right hand side with those blocks, uh, so everything that is in gray, that's what we eliminate from the development pipeline. We only focus on the blue ones. I think it's time for Q and A. Um, if you have any questions, um, thank you. Get to thank you, Alex. Um, well, it's really amazing to see there is over sixty percent of the code is generated. So um, for the attendees, please feel. Free Free to type your question. So, um, how how is the DDL you're talking about and different from the Swagger and other tools? Um, I think it's um, it's different in many ways, but I think the primary thing is just the complexity of the relations that you could express with it. Because um, I gave actually an example where where I had side by side comparison of the definitions in the and the code that we generate, uh, sorry, in the definition that we have and the open API specs. The problem is usually that it's not really engineer friendly because uh, at least I'm not used to it. Maybe someone is used to it if they see it every day, but engineers are more used to see something very close to how they would write a code. And that helps a lot. Um, then we, we transpile everything. We don't use templates. Uh, we transpile everything. So we parse those definitions into an actual AST and then transpile it into target languages. So we don't, like it's it's always as complex as your models are with all of the relations, with hierarchy and everything. So it's not like just, you know, replacing names and that's gonna be the uh, the source code uh, for you. So yeah, it's, um, the, 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 the type system is quite extensive because we have a lot of different types which are not typical for kind of design languages. Uh, so we have like those ADTs we have, Either uh, we have a lot on the the hierarchy and how you could do nominal inheritance. You could have structural inheritance. We have some things where you could remove fields easily, which is also not not, not something quite typical for the languages. But it helped us to kind of wrap up a lot of the complexity when it comes down to to those um, 
uh, to those definitions, it helped us to just wrap it up into some kind of quite explicit uh, language, which is very easy to read for engineers. Thank you, Alex. Um, you can now stop sharing your screen. And um, there is another question asked in the chat, but unfortunately, um, it's time for next talk. So um, maybe you can um, answer Albert's question in the chat. Yeah, yeah, sure. Alrighty. Thank you, Alex. All right, thank you. Sorry for taking a bit longer. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for listening. No, it's totally fine. <laughs>